Hello, and welcome back to Step by Step through Mark's Gospel. Jesus dies and everyone goes home. Is that it? Is that what we've been building to? If so, worst ending ever. But is there more here than meets the eye? The section of Mark's Gospel that we're looking at today is chapter 15 and verses 33 through to 41. I put a link to an online Bible in the video description, which you can use to read the passage for yourself. Now, my grandpa and I were close. I'd spent a lot of time with him and my nan when I was growing up. I loved going there for lunch, beans on toast, every time, and they always let me choose where the beans went, on the top or on the side. Over time, old age set in and came with strokes and other medical difficulties. Slowly, my grandpa deteriorated and got weaker and weaker, although he never lost his joy in seeing people. I remember the day that he died. I was visiting my other set of grandparents and my mum phoned to talk to me. The message was simple but hard to take in. I was struck by how much I wanted to know how it had happened. His death wasn't unexpected, but I needed a wider picture than just knowing He'd gone. As we look at the death of Jesus, Mark gives us that wider picture. Jesus died on the cross. Yes, that's clear and obvious, but we're told more than that here. In verse 33, Mark tells us, At noon darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. It's midday, the point where the sun is at its highest and daylight is at its brightest. Yet the air is filled with a claw in darkness. What's going on? A few years ago, I experienced a solar eclipse. The moon passed in front of the sun and the daylight disappeared. Is that what's happening here? No. First, that solar eclipse lasted only a few minutes. The darkness Mark speaks about is there for three hours. But that's not the only problem with that theory. Jesus was crucified at the time of Passover, which always happens at full moon. This would mean the moon is in completely the wrong position for a solar eclipse. The darkness here is not a coincidence of nature. It is tied to what is happening on the cross. But how? Darkness in the Bible, and more widely, is seen as a picture of judgment and anger. When the dark clouds gather, The sky takes on an angry look. It becomes oppressive and frightening. That's the picture here. The darkness symbolises God's wrath and God's judgement. But who is God angry with? Mark has told us and sought to prove to us that Jesus is God's son. Here he is rejected and ridiculed, hanging on the cross. Is God's anger directed at those who are mistreating Jesus? No. The staggering statement here is that it is not the Romans or the Jews who are the object of his wrath, but Jesus himself. The soldiers and onlookers mock without consequence, but Jesus cries out in a pain-filled cry, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What is going on? Has Jesus somehow messed up? Has he blown God's plan in some way? Something must have happened. Back in chapter 9 and verse 7, God had told the disciples, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. How has that been transformed to this is my son whom I judge? We see the answer in a verse found in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah, writing 750 years before Jesus was born, explains that the Messiah, God's coming king, would die. Yet he goes further. He tells us, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. What does this mean? Isaiah is explaining to us that the Messiah would die under judgment for sin. Yet it wouldn't be for his sin, it would be for ours. That's what's going on at the cross. Jesus stands condemned, but ultimately not by the chief priests or by Pilate, but by his Father in heaven. Not because he had done anything wrong, but because he stands in our place to pay the price for our sin. Imagine the cost being talked about here. I remember the science lesson when I first discovered that water was magnetic. In front of each of us was a small sink with a tap. 
We all took great pleasure in turning the tap on and using our magnet to redirect the water away from the sink and onto the bench, making big puddles. Well, here the wrath of God for our sin is being redirected onto Jesus, his son. And remember, Jesus is not an unwilling participant. He has come into this world for this very purpose. Throughout his life, he has been aiming for this day. We've seen that in our journey through Mark's gospel. The darkness, though, is not the only extraordinary event we're told about. After telling us that Jesus died, Mark takes us back into the city and into the heart of the temple. Here we find two rooms called the Holy Place and the Most Holy Place. They are separated by a massive thick curtain. There is symbolism here. The curtain is a reminder that because of sin, we cannot come into the presence of God. As we stand looking at this temple, the moment comes when Jesus breathes his last breath. His life leaves his body and his head hangs. At precisely that moment, the curtain in front of us is torn from top to bottom. Why? What more symbolism? Now, because of what Jesus has done on the cross by his death, because he has paid for our sin, we can know God. Sin deserves God's eternal judgment. That's how God says it in the Bible. That's the offence that every sin is in his eyes. Yet here, how incredible is this? Here is Jesus, God's King and God's Son. Here is God himself come in the person of Jesus Christ, paying for that sin so that we can be forgiven and know God. What does this mean for you and me? It means there is a way to get right with God. It means there is a way to deal with the wrong that we've done and no complete and total forgiveness with God. That way is Jesus. In verse 39, Mark tells us about the Roman centurion who was in charge of crucifying Jesus. When the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Now, this centurion knew a thing or two about death. This was not his first rodeo. Yet as Jesus died, he saw something different. Do you see that today? The Bible tells us Jesus died for sin so that we can be forgiven. How do we receive that? Jesus tells us all the way back in Mark chapter 1 and verse 15. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. If we want to be part of God's kingdom, if we want to receive the forgiveness he bought for us at the cross with his death, we need to repent and believe. We need to respond. Could I ask you a question? Have you done that? Well, that's all for today. Next time will be our last session in Mark's Gospel as we look at what happened next. It may surprise you. If you want to know, when that comes out, keep an eye on our Facebook page, YouTube channel, or on the podcast. Hopefully, see you next time.